It's The Journey with drug and alcohol attorney Mark G. Aster. All right, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of The Journey. Uh, live from my office in Boca Raton, I'm super excited to have my now good friend Jennifer Jimenez with us. Ah, you said it right. Thank I you. I did, right? How yeah. about that? Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited and well, nervous. You're, yeah, so... You can say it. <laughs> model, actress, reality star, and you're the nervous one. I yeah. find that amazing. And you came all the way from LA just to be live on our show. I know, I know, I, I did. I um, I'm, I guess we should say the story. Like I came in here and I um, was so nervous that I needed to go blow my nose. I either like get cotton mouthy or both, and uh, my nose starts kind of getting all. Like, so no. Oh, microphone. Oh, there we go. You see? Uh, you see? I'm not even technically savvy with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's Better. All right. Okay, we're rolling. <laughs> So you're all, I can't believe you're nervous. You've been, I mean, you've been on TV, you've spoken to live audiences and. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I feel like it's a good sign that I'm nervous, um, you know, cause I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell my truth and uh, I, I still feel uh, vulnerable and I still suffer from people pleasing. My mom does this, by the way, I don't know why I just need to tell this, it's like a brain fart. And uh, my mom does this when she talks you know, with her little accent and like when I get nervous, I do that too. But my nose drips or like, I feel like I'm gonna start my period or poop my pants. Um, well, but don't I'm not do, gonna do don't, any of that Don't right do, now. don't, don't do. <laughs> Don't do any of that stuff. I mean, you can do, but I... No, I, no, 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 listen, don't worry. All I, all I know is if you do that, we'll probably both end up in front of the pump page of the National Enquirer, which I yeah. don't know if it'll be good for my business, but... Yeah, I don't think it'll be no, that great. Yeah, no. like, I mean, it, I mean, any, you know, publicity, I guess, is good publicity, but we don't want it that way. Well, you're all... I mean, I, you know, when it's funny, when... So we met through our mutual friends, Doug and Heidi. Who I love. They're amazing people, right? I have right? a major girl crush on Heidi. I can understand yeah. why. She's terrific, and, She's and Doug is... She's a strong is, woman. Doug is amazing. And, you know, so when they told me all about you, I sort of said, well, I'm going to do a little research on Jennifer, and I sort of... And that was like, wow. First of all, I was like, wow. <laughs> um, and I'm still wow. Oh, but, thank you. <laughs> um, but you're like all over the internet. I'm like, wow, that's... You've had a very interesting life. I, I've been blessed. I've been blessed. Um, uh, from a girl who was born in LA and grew up in Argentina on dirt roads and donkeys to uh, to living this life is- The been, LA lifestyle. It's been incredible. So I want to go way back because you said your mom has an accent. So is, she, is your mom from Argentina? Yes, my whole family's from Argentina. Um, I'm first generation born in America. Parents decided to come to America and name me one of the most common names, Jennifer, and raise me back in Argentina. And uh, later on through the years, we'd come back and forth um, back to California. My parents realized my little brother and I would probably have more opportunities here in America than in Argentina. So they sacrificed everything. And uh, we came back to California and... Uh, that's my story. So, that's <laughs> and <an> scene. <laughs> so I don't know. So, so were you were you so you were born and raised in Los Angeles? I was born, raised in Argentina and LA, but I I grew up speaking Spanish in Argentina. So I came back to LA and I learned English, and uh, I in school and I would try to break my my thick accent. Um, my eyes are watering. Uh, that's another sign of nerves. Um, and uh, black is dripping. <laughs> I wouldn't have noticed. I can tell, sorry. It's all right, it's good. <laughs> Just calling it all out. Um, but uh, yeah, I learned English in school and, and you know, the whole like, it, it, I grew up so different than, you know, what people think. How so? Well, you know, in Argentina, I kind of call it, I mean, it was so, I mean, dirt roads, donkeys, like my grandmother always cooked my friends the chickens in the backyard and, um, you know, you'd have to go, it, it's just, it's different. You know, the, the, I feel like in Europe and, and in South America, you, you live, you work to live and here we live to work, you know, and, um, it, it family's very intermeshed, intertwined, you know, here there's a lot of boundaries, you know, and, and a lot of. I feel it's a little bit more. Um, Is that what we call political correctness today? I think so. Maybe, yeah. yeah. We're definitely in, a, in living in an environment where you got to be watch, careful what you say because you might offend somebody, even if you say it in jest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, in our, like, I didn't know anything, you know, growing up, like, you know, my, my grandmother had one of her brothers and have our uh, legs and he was like on this this board and like he'd like drag himself and I didn't know that was handicap or like I didn't know what you know gay was like we had you know I have mem you know people in my family that are you know are, are gay and and like I I don't even know if that's politically correct to say that way either but you know I didn't know there was no barrier of that love was love you know and and we treated everyone the same I love that yeah I love that so so how old when you when you came here from Argentina 
six and a half okay. when I started school. Yeah. So you came? Did you come? You came with parents? And I know you have a. I think you told me you had a brother, right? I do. I have a little brother. A little brother. Yeah. Okay. A little so, brother who's a lot taller than I am. Then he must be really tall. Yeah. Because you're pretty yeah. tall. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're in heels, but you were definitely taller than yeah, me. My I, mom, like, yeah. I had to reach. I just like reach out <laughs> to give you a hug. No, you're pretty tall. I think I'm just just right around six feet, just right around. But okay. I've got five five beautiful nieces. It's all women in my family. My brother has two girls. My sister has three. They're all taller than me, better looking than me, and smarter than me. It, I'm telling you, I am very blessed with that. I know my mother wants a grandson, but and I'm, I can't promise you she's going to get one. But we have I have five amazing nieces, and they're really amazing women. They're terrific. Yeah, that's amazing. That's- so so when you say tall women, I'm used to tall women. They're all tall women in my family. Yeah. Well, my family, like my mom's. Five four. My dad was like five nine. I'm five nine and a half. My dad, my brother is six two and a half, and everyone else is like little. Not well, not as tall as we are. So I wonder, when you were in school, you were a good student. I was a great student you were. until I got discovered uh, modeling, and then I was like in honors classes and um, and all that. I was like in cheerleading. What was your favorite class? Uh, I think it was. I think it was PE, but um, <laughs> no, uh, I think it was English, actually. It's the first thing that came to mind right now. Okay. Were you popular with the boys? Uh, no. No? No, I was like really quiet. And then um, I got uh, in my first uh, fight and it was with this guy who till this day we're really good friends with. His you beat him is, up? Uh, he says I did. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. His name is Charles Poe. He was a badass. Yeah, and you beat him up anyway. Yeah, we always talked about it. Like he ended up playing uh, pro baseball uh, in in the in baseball, so uh, he became a pro. And I, am I saying it right? And uh, we always said like you know we always had each other's back, and like till this day, like we still support each other and and encourage each other. And and you know we we went to like a reunion. I, it was it was like maybe the our fifteen year reunion, and you know we were like we did what we said we were gonna do. You know living our dreams. I love it. So did you enjoy school? I mean, I hated school, I have to tell you. I, you know, it's it's interesting. I, um, for so many years, didn't really remember if I liked it. I thought I wasn't happy because like, as I got sober, I was dealing with a lot of internal issues and, and I, because I was so in those things, those problems, I didn't know if I was happy but then when I went to that reunion it's so funny we're talking about this um everyone always said like you were so nice you were so happy you were you know and then I started remembering all the good times um so yeah I did love school um it was did you like your teachers did you have a favorite teacher I did I have two favorite teachers and I will be eternally grateful for those two women um my first grade teacher Mrs. Phillips she was so loving and so kind and then my fifth grade teacher Mrs. Kirk I wanted to be like her. She was like amazing. We, I got to go over our house and have dinner, like a bunch of students who did really well. You know, you, that was like the reward. You'd get to go to have dinner with her and her family. And um, I'd just be like, oh my God, this is so cool. So so you said your favorite class was PE. I know you said that sort of jokingly. It was mine too, actually, because I was a lousy student. So were you good at sports? Were you an athlete? Um, I was in my own head. I mean, I was good. Like I, I did really good in, in track and field and, and basketball. But again, like I got discovered in my like going into my freshman year uh, of high school, so I kind of didn't get to experience the high school years. However, I did graduate and get a diploma um, from that school, but I would only go to school like two months out of the year. Every All right. Year. So let's talk about that because you said you got discovered. I know that you did. You how long did you model for? Um, well, I, I got discovered when I was uh, turning, I was close to turning 14 years old. Um, I was at the Santa Monica Pier with my mom, my little I, brother. I, well, you know, I used to go there all the time because I told you, you know, I lived in LA for, for three years and it's really quite beautiful. It is beautiful. It is. Oh, my poor LA right now. My heart it's, is, uh, yeah. it's burning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've it's, been there when it's burning. You can smell it. I remember, go, actually, I remember once flying at San Diego and as you get off the plane, you could smell it. Yeah, it see. was like sepia the day I left. Um, I left a couple of days ago, and you know, I I have a lot of friends who lost homes and um, and lost everything right now. So it's like very, I, I I'm very emotional over it. Um, it's uh, it's heartbreaking. I mean, I've been in fires and earthquakes, and I even did a hurricane here, Irma. Um, but this one was like no other. Um, it, it it's and it's still going. It's still going. It's terrible. Listen, I, let's back up a second. Santa Monica. So you're on the okay. pier. So you're I'm 
on was, the pier. I was I was on the pier. Uh, I was at the Santa Monica Pier with my mom and my little brother on a Sunday afternoon. We were playing. This photographer named Bruce Weber, um, till this day still one of the biggest photographers in the world, came up to my mom and I and said, you know, I'd love to shoot your daughter. I'm doing this thing for this designer. It's a really big designer. I'm a legit photographer. She has the right look. Blah, blah, blah. Did you think it was like BS? I mean, did you think this guy was just like a bit of a goofy guy? I mean, what did you think? Did I, Did you realize who it even was? No, I mean, again, I came from dirt roads and donkeys in Argentina, you know what I mean? Like it, cobblestones, like it was so different than like, I didn't grow up in the LA world, you know, and I didn't know about entertainment. However, my dad told me um, years later, he said that, you know, he's like, when you were a little girl, you would look at it the, at, uh, at the grocery store. I look at magazines and I'd say, I'm gonna be on that. I'm gonna be on that, on the cover of the magazine. It was predestined, yeah, you say? Yeah, um, which is crazy. And, uh, and my mom was a little hesitant, you know, I mean, we did didn't know anything and uh, he said can you guys show up the next day of course I convinced my mom to so you're to show you're, up. you're at the time you're in school is your mom working uh, my mom was working yes Got at it. the time and uh, and my father obviously they weren't together Got it. Um, and uh, and then uh, I convinced my mom to let me show up the next day and I had like really long hair you know I, I, I'm like straight like I hadn't you know grown developed. yet like developed <laughs> and uh, and he cut all my hair off as short as yours um, and uh, I became his girl like I mean the minute I was in front of that camera it was like you know I, I knew exactly what to do. It was weird. It was like it all just came together. So that's weird, right? Because, you know, you, you told me you were a little uncomfortable, right? And you told me that whenever you speak to, and you said you've spoken in front of thousands of people, you get nervous. And yet, it really, I mean, you're a natural. I mean, you said the minute you did it, you knew it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you say that. I feel like they were like staring off so many things, but um, somebody uh, was interviewing me one day and they said to me, you know, where is the safest place? like for you, where do you feel the most comfortable? And without hesitation, I just said in front of a camera. And they just looked at me and there's like this uncomfortable silence. So and, what do you think that is? Well, they and they were like, wow. And, and I was like, what? And you saying that? And I said, and he, and the person said, you know, that is the saddest place to be. And I, I, that makes me sad for you. And I was like, no. I want to know, so when you're in front of a camera, do you feel alive? I do. You do, right? So I when do. I, so I spent a lot of time doing trial work, especially when I was a young prosecutor. and. I, I, it was weird. The first time I did a trial, especially did the, where I did the closing argument, which is where you really start to, you can kind of get into it. I almost felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. I was like, who is this person, right? It was a different person. And you know what I'm saying? I get as nervous today as I did the very first time, but once I get up and I, I, I sort of switch into my alter ego, you know, the trial guy, it's amazing, right? You just tap into a whole other sense of energy, stuff comes to you, you just, it's different. Yeah. You get nervous, but somehow you just tap into another another realm. It, it's so true. Right? Uh, and I feel like that, like I always say, like when it comes to my friends and family, like if you're in my circle, I'll go down for you. I'll take a bullet for you. You know, like your family. And I will fight for you. But like when it comes to me, I'm like, um, uh, uh, like for me, you know, like me again, you know, going, can I stick up for myself? And I'm learning, you know, through the years. But the modeling and being in front of the camera and becoming, you know, different things and, and characters and, you know, morphing into these, you know, these collaborations with people is so amazing for me, even in the acting world too. But when I speak, um, you know, I kind Could you of, speak great? I mean- Thank you. You really do. I thank mean, you. and you have a lot to say and it's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I kind of, you know, I, I, I lose my, I allow God to come through me and just speak. And and when I'm, you know, it, speaking to like other people, other addicts or alcoholics or someone who's dealing with something, like I always say, like, I just, I have to let the spirit speak, not me. Okay, acting's pretty... different though you know like acting's like you know you become a character you lose yourself in you know but only through your personal experience can you like grab that character so so i want to say how long did you model for well okay so i um i i'm i'm the youngest girl on the cover of american l um i you know became bruce weber's girl i did um it was for azadina laya who's still you know one of the biggest designers ever he passed away last year and um and uh, I, you know, was doing all these things. I did this movie um, with Bruce Weber called Let's Get Lost. It was a documentary on Chet Baker. And um, it got nominated for um, best uh, documentary at the Oscars. Like it won every film festival.
role. And I didn't know that for years. Like I, I could have been at the Oscars. Like, you know, so, like how, was, so how did you transition from modeling to acting? Because yeah, okay, so, I know that, that that sometimes happens, right? I mean, Cindy Crawford. And funny, I was when I first looked at you, I said, wow, she looks like a Latin Cindy Crawford. Right? Oh my it's God. Not, oh, thank you. The mole, I think it's the mole. Thank mole. you. You know, modeling, they wanted me to remove my They moles. did? Why? And no. Because they said like, oh, you know, girls don't have that. Like, it's not right. And I was like, oh, no, it's a beauty that. spot. My mother used to live with a beauty spot. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm glad I didn't remove them. Oh. Um, and they wanted me to get my nose done. I was like, I'm not doing any of that stuff. Like, that's not happening. Um, and, um, you know, what happened was with Bruce, um, I did uh, like two weeks of As You Elias collection book. Um, and then we did a campaign afterwards because I became his girl. I literally stayed at the Shangri-La Hotel um, on PC on, in Santa Monica and um, for like months. And uh, from there we did this campaign and then we did um, this movie uh, on Chet Baker, a really famous jazz musician. And we shot that for like two or three weeks. And then I flew with him to uh, San Francisco for another like three, four weeks. Um, and we did Calvin Klein. Um, and I shot the Calvin Klein campaign Campaign. And one of the things I remember is how old are you at this point? I'm 14. You still 14 doing Calvin Klein? Yeah. What you? I mean, like when you look at Asni Elias collection book, um, I'm in them, and I'm like, you know, I think I'm 13 uh, at the time, and I'm completely, you know, you can s and sheer things like you can see like everything, or like I'm with another girl and like a G string. It looks like we're like, you know, to get. I'm like, I, you. Just, I didn't know. I mean, you just didn't know. Um, what you? What you? What your mom think? You know, because it was so innocently done, you know, and, and in front of, in the camera and in that scene, in that scenario, in that place at that time, it was so safe. Um, you know, I remember that my mom and I were talking about this a couple of years, like two years ago. I remember my mom used to travel with me, thank God. Most of the time she would travel with me. Um, and I don't think I'd be alive if it wasn't for my mom traveling with me because I'm sure I would have gotten taken advantage of more than I already did. Um, but I, we were shooting with Jill Ben Simone, who's like a ginormous photographer. I'm in Paris. I'm on my hands and knees. They're like, tilt your head back, you know, and it's a double spread of me looking like, come fuck me. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. You can words. say that. Okay. And like, I'm 14, maybe 15 years old. My mom is in the back like but it doesn't look like it as we're shooting that you know that you think they're shooting an angle but then it's like a double spread of like me like he hello like, well if they had seen the whole photo the whole room it probably wouldn't have looked like it but it they didn't look of, it at all. it's the way they shot you I'm sure exactly. and zoomed in and all that other fun stuff exactly I mean I was literally selling sex when I didn't even know what that was about um, at all at that time um, but one of the things I remember is uh, with, with Bruce and that movie that I did um, was that my voice I got to speak and I was in front of the camera and my voice mattered and that I was a part of a collaboration and as a model most of the time um, at that time your voice didn't matter. You know, I remember I would try to get, give creative input. And a lot of times in Europe and, and other countries, they'd say like, you know what, you're just a hanger. You're always replaceable. Like, we don't want to hear what you say, what you think, you know? And, and so I lost my voice. Like those early teenage years when you're supposed to learn about, you know, self-esteem, self-worth, you know, do, you know, things of integrity. And I, it was all about my outsides. You know, it was only good, as good as my next job cover campaign. But I wore many masks, you know, and modeling allowed me to wear. Max. So it sounds like you did a lot of traveling, though. I did. Where'd I you, did. Where'd you travel to? I mean, I, I think by the time I graduated uh, high school, I'd been out of state or country like 33 times. Wow. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. I had gone to um, Paris like probably a good uh, 15 times. I went to Austria. I went to Budapest, Hungary. I went to Milan, uh, Rome, uh, Tokyo. Uh, I mean, obviously, like New York a bunch of times. Miami. Um, I went to... Uh, Bora, did I go to Bora Bora? I went to um, Hawaii. I went, I mean, I was everywhere. I was all over Europe. I was all over Europe. I mean. London. Any, I think anybody sort of listened to that would say, wow, that's, I mean, that's a big jump from dirt roads and donkeys, right? I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, that's, you know, the kind of life you can only dream about. But I mean, in reality, were you, were you enjoying it? I mean, were you, did you feel like you were, did you feel lost? I mean, what was going on? I mean, internally. Wow, you're really taking me back. Um, internally, I, um, I, I felt like it was so fast. It was such a fast moving life, you know, and I would try to go back to school and, and fit in like a normal kid. I was exhausted, you know, and like, and be in public high school and then I'd run home and, you know, in the chaos of life there and then get into the, you know, go into the modeling world and I became the Did your friends in family. high school know what you were doing, that you were traveling the world and you were all over, you know, magazines and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they did, but I, 
I just wanted to be a kid. I remember being in Tokyo. I was 15 years old and um, I was turning 16, my sweet fucking 16th birthday in Tokyo. And I'm with all these girls and they're all my best friends. I can't remember one name today. You know, um, I all these agents, you know, they all love me. They didn't. They love that I made them money. You know, I was at some playboy, Japanese playboy man's house and there's Picasso paintings. And I was like, what's that? You know, like I didn't know, you know, and, and I was with these girls and um, I remember I have the photos I'm gonna put them in my book um, when I uh, write that book finish writing that book and I'm there and I'm smiling and I'm blowing my candles and I'm making wishes and I remember calling my girlfriends back at home and I was like what are you wearing to prom you know like I just I wanted to be at home I wanted to be at school I wanted to be with my girlfriends I just wanted to be a kid you know but that was the world that was given to me and I was there you know, I mean, it was many mass, like I said. I, I got to think at least financially, it must have been a, sort of, I mean, it must have really helped the family, no? I mean, I did. I mean, I became the provider of the family and all that. But I mean, I was working like they, my mom couldn't travel with me to Europe, uh, to Tokyo at that time. And, um, you know, they promised I'd live with the head agent. And, you know, when I got there and all this, and I lived alone um, in a model's apartment, um, in a men's model's apartment. It was weird. Um, and I worked, they had me working like 17 hours a day. Um, in, in between that, I'd be at bars drinking, you know, I was, you know, I learned to smoke hash there. It wasn't really that great. I mean, you know. Sorry. So, so let's sort of get, get into that. Cause I mean, I, Oh wait, let's go back to the act. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, um, when I wanted to end modeling, which was years later, um, I, um, I kind of feel like I still do, you know, still like, I mean, I still take photos, but not as a, I mean, more as a personality, you know, um, today and for fashion, but as you know, it's a little different. Um, I don't go seeking it. It thankfully, you know, it's a little different story today. But anyways, um, I remember I loved being in front of the camera and I wanted to, to be able to move and that my voice would matter. And I loved, um, the acting. I loved being on, you know, film that way. And so I studied, um, I took like intense classes and I studied with this amazing woman for many, many years. But in the beginning I studied for, um, a year or so. And I had gone, I was helping a girlfriend of mine who worked at an agency. She needed a translator for, um, this, these people from Spain that were doing these, you know, high paying jobs for these huge actresses like Sharon Stone and all this stuff. And I was translating uh, one night um, at dinner and this man and his wife were there and they were the managers of Sharon Stone. He was Sharon Stone's manager and I was with these, um, the Spanish crew. And I got along with the wife and the husband, you know, really well. And, and he had my number because of the job I was doing for my girlfriend. And um, he calls me the next day and he's like, you know, my I, I just want to let you know it was such a pleasure meeting you and my wife absolutely loved you and, and so did I and I don't know if you're interested in, in acting but you need to be an actress like I, I know I know what I'm talking about and he like was um, uh, Faye Dunaway's a manager and um, all these ginormous with Famke Jensen and all these That's other pretty, people pretty flattering no? yeah and I was like as a matter of fact I've been studying for a while and he's like great so I have this audition for you it's uh, tomorrow it's for all the pretty horses and um, I went for that audition Penelope Cruz got it. It was my first audition. My third audition was this movie. Were you called disappointed when you didn't get it? No. I, I Did was you think like, you would get it? I mean, no. I mean, like, he's like, you know what? I just want to take you out there. I want people to meet you. And it was funny. He's like, don't tell anyone that you're a model. And I'm like, that you were a model. I'm like, well, it's kind of hard not to. You're right. I mean, you know, all these magazines and exactly. stuff. Exactly. And, uh, and my third audition was this movie called flawless. And I went and I read, I, I studied, I worked really hard with my, um, with my coach. And then I went and I read for the casting director. And then I came back. I had two more callbacks on that. And I came back and the fourth callback I was reading with the actor and the actor was Robert De Niro. Wow. I was going to play the prostitute in that movie that taught him how to dance a tango. Did and, you like him? Was he nice? Okay, so all of a sudden I was like, my my coach said, so go I, in as character. You, were you nervous? I Was worked, your nose running? I, <laughs> my nose was probably running. Um, <laughs> I walked in there as character. So like she was a New York, she was from New York and stuff and she was just kind of really tough and hard, kind of hard on the edges, kind of like I am, but just a little bit more rough. And I walked in like that, you know, so I kind of knew I needed to lose myself, but be present too. And he was like, you know, very quiet and shy. And he's like, how do you want to do this? And I was like, however you would like, you know, and he's like, well, and I go, why don't we just read this once through together and then we can, you know, do it. And as we're reading it, like, 
a quarter into it, he morphs into his character. And the guy, you know, Robert's character had like a, a stroke. And so like he was like went into that. Did place. you think that was weird? I mean, also, no, no, I just went, oh, my God, this is really happening in my head. I'm like, holy shit. Like, you got to get into character and like, just roll with it. Like, I knew I needed to roll with it. So I just like went into it with him and like, you know, we're lip to lip dancing. And then I got another call back and it was between me and this girl and the girl that, um, had 20 years. She was 20 years older than I was. And they decided to go into that direc- that direction. But I just went, you know what? I think I'm in the right position. Like, I think I'm doing the right thing. This is what my calling You're like, is. like, I can I mean, do this. Yeah, my third audition with, like, is with Robert De Niro. So, like, I mean, it was pretty amazing. I, I don't regret it at all. That's really yeah. a pretty, that's an amazing, amazing. story. Yeah. Did you tell your mom about that? Um, I, obviously, yeah. I mean, She must have flipped out, yeah, right? I don't talk about this story, though, at all. It's, it's a great weird. story, though. Why yeah. don't you, you should share this, Because no? I want to share, I mean, there's some things I just kind of, keep, I'm keeping to share for my book. I keep hitting this. It's okay, story, don't guys. worry. I do, um, too. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I guess it's just time. It's coming out. It's supposed to come out right now. When you, so, okay, so there's a couple things I want to talk to you about. So let's talk about the book because you got a book coming out. Is that are you writing I, a book? I'm writing a book. So I started writing with these two women, and um, all of a sudden, you know, uh, it got so deep because they ask so much, so many details. I'm personally, I'm, I'm having ghostwriters to help me. Well, you need someone to ask the questions. It's tough to sit down. And, yeah, um, and like they make me, you know, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? What am I tasting? What am I hearing? You know, all these things. And all of a sudden I had um, some stuff come up that I didn't, I had blackouts from. I have a lot of blackouts. Um, it, like I was saying earlier, like even in childhood, like I didn't know, like I forgot that I had great time in school. Um, but uh, some trauma came up. And so it was a lot for me to handle. And I had to go through that. Um, and I put like kind of I put it on hold. And like now I'm like, OK, I, I just like it's right here. I need to do it. Like I'm ready to do it um, I because I, it, it's time. So when's it when are we going to see the book? What's, have you got a title? Annette? So I have um, a few titles. Should I say it or should do you, I? Uh, do I, I mean, so, like, I don't have the copyrights on them, so. Do well, I, I tell you, we'll keep them a secret for right now. Okay. We'll keep them because we don't want to get anyone I mean, in trouble, okay. and I don't want you to spoil the surprise because <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be one hell of a book, too. Yeah. Are they going to make a movie about you? You know, um, a lot of times people are like, "You're like the female, like you're the." Because it seems like the natural progression is book movie, right? Yeah, I mean, like I'm kind of like my story is kind of like Gia. You do, do you see that movie or read that book? Um, she was a, a model like it was Angelina Jolie played her um, and uh, I'm just the other side of it that lived through it um, pretty much you know she she unfortunately died dies uh, died yeah uh, but uh, it uh, yeah yeah I'm, I I I uh, I wanted okay, so this was another thing that happened. I can't believe I'm telling you all I these love all secrets. This, this I, like, is great. I'm just like not should we even, not be sharing this? Is it, is no, it, I don't care. I, I love know. it. I'm I, glad I'm that like you. So like, I'm. This is where I'm at today. I love it. Um, they. I wanted to name names. Like I'm in that Me Too movement thing, but like I wanted to name names. This is before the whole. All right, Me so you know. This is, so I got a question. Do you, uh, so I mean, the, wait, the, but you keep having questions. I gotta say it. All right, well, go ahead. Okay. I can't help you. You say one thing, and it makes you want to ask know, another question. I'm a lawyer. Okay, you can't, I I can't help myself. I know, but I got. But you know what? I'll let you go first. Okay. Ladies first. Thank you. Um, Are we having a little thing here? I'm kind of like a DA, FBI, CIA slash lawyer thing too. Like, yeah, I'm in my own head, but that's like it's my okay. Own degree. Okay, it's good. So, um, <laughs> I like before like the whole Me Too movement. I wanted to Deanna's, name names. Diana's like, about to wet herself over there. She's well, like, she's like, I've never seen him with a guest like this. Before. Really? Isn't she great? Dad is like, yeah, she's great. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you were saying. I, I wanted to name <laughs> names about certain things that happened, you know, because I have a lot of names. And um, people, my at the time, my book agent then was saying, you know what? If you name names, you can just kiss your career goodbye. And now it's like, and then like, a couple months later, like as all that was happening, I was dealing with that stuff that I was just telling you that came up. And then the whole Me Too movement came out and I was like, yeah, no, I don't want to be like I and now it's like if you don't name names, like I was right. Like I knew I should have trusted my gut, like, you know, to anyways. So, um, you know, there there are things that I definitely want to address so then other people can relate, you know, because I still think that like we today in society still don't want to talk about it, even though we want to talk about it. And we talk about it through social media. And I think it's important to be able to have, you know, a communicative relationship with other people and be able to communicate and tell our story, you know, regardless if you're an addict or not, or if you're, you know, just, uh, you know, a, a norm, as we call them normies, or if you're like a, a mom, a dad, like we all 
all have issues. Like we're all going through something that's every day of our lives. We're all on a different journey. And like to be able to express that and not to be like hindered with that, I think is so important. Well, so do you, so I mean this- So what's your question? Well, I've got lots of questions for you, Jen. I tell you, <laughs> I know I was going to have lots of questions, but not I didn't realize I was going to have quite as many questions. But so, so there's a there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about because you're so you're so you really are you're fun. You're interesting too. Thank you. It's great. I'm glad you're here. Um, so I even almost done, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. I almost don't know what to start with. But you know, so let's talk about the whole Me Too thing, just a little bit about it, only because you know th- that's one of the th- sort of things that's come sort of come out recently, especially in social media and now in the news, where there apparently is this sort of atmosphere within Hollywood, right, that it's okay for the men, the producers, directors to take advantage of some of the women. So, I mean, you modeled, you acted. I mean, is that is that what's going on? Or is there, Absolutely, is, 100%. Okay. It's going on. It has gone on. Um, it's gone on, I think, even before the Hollywood world. You know, I mean, I, I think it's gone on for, you know, many, many, many generations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, and people never talked about it, you know, and, and we're in a place today where you should talk about it, you know, and, and there's been a lot of that that happened. And unfortunately, there's no union in the modeling world. The modeling world, it started with me with the modeling world, you know, and and all these, you know, people taking advantage, you know, not only um, physically, sexually, emotionally, verbally, but like financially too. Like agents would just rob you, you know, and you just kind of, again, your voice didn't matter. Today, thank God for like social media and like the Gigi Hadids of the world that like, you know, talk about things and they don't get taken advantage on those levels, you know, they're more aware. Um, but uh, yeah, that it's definitely, it's something that's happening in Hollywood. And you know, Unfortunately, it's still going to happen if we don't talk about it, you know, and if we don't use our voice, you know, whether you be a woman or a man, you know, it's happening to both sides. Okay. So, so in the book, are you going to sort of name names? Are you going to yes. do? Okay. All right. So I'm not, so I'm not going to ask you name names I here. Won't. Okay. That's good. Cause well, first of all, I know you don't want to name names right now, but also would spoil the book and I want to be able to read the book cause I know it's going to be dynamite. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, I mean, I would, if I If I felt like I still am like that was the whole thing is that I was dealing with them. And I remember going to therapy when the whole Me Too movement came on and like I was getting, you know, I was getting people from uh, different, uh, uh, you know, outlets like from, you know, the New York Post, like just different people getting a hold of me. And I'm like, how did they get a hold of me? Like, how do they know? So somehow, some way it got leaked and I was not able to address it because all I would say to my therapist is like, and when I speak, I talk about it, is that it was like flashing, like lots of faces and moments, but I can't slow it down. And so I've been working really hard on trying to slow down some of the situations. And I've been very clear on the other ones as well. So if I could, like, and I felt like I would not like lose my mind afterwards, I would talk about it. But otherwise, like, I'm still gonna save it. I can see, I can just see just by your reaction, you know, Yeah. The- it's emotional for you. It is, you know, I mean, it's sad. It's kind of like, it's so heartbreaking that we all at some in some way get discriminated, you know, whether you're in the Hollywood world or, you know, you're, it, it, we all do in some way, you know, especially women. So do you, do you think writing the book and maybe talking about it has been, I guess the word cathartic for you, is it? It has. It has. I mean, you know, again, I still suffer from the people pleasing syndrome, but like, I got to let go. It, this is not about, it, this isn't just about me anymore. This is about allowing other people to probably, po- hopefully being able to connect or go, shit, I, I, bet I a lot of I'm not like gonna, her. <laughs> I bet a lot of people are going to relate to it. I hope so. I think they will do. So I want to, at some point you, you, I read that you got involved in the whole reality TV stuff. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that, because okay. it's kind of interesting. So I got sober. Um, I've been trying to get sober since uh, I was 21. I'm clearly not 21 anymore. Um, 24, so, 25. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> if I say 25, if I try to say like 30, it would be like, wow, you're not looking so hot for a 30-year-old. Um, but it's true, Don't Don't, right? get, don't I mean, get yourself, Jen. Um, <laughs> You still got game. Uh, thank you. You do. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, um, I, you know, I'd gone sober. I'd finally gone to treatment. Um, 
my mom, my best friend, uh, put me in treatment. I went, I only went to shut those two women up. I was going to go for five days under my terms and my terms was, was five days. I needed to eat and sleep anyways. And I was going to shut them up. It lasted nine and a half months. I did relapse in treatment. Um, I went to this place called Los Encinas in Pasadena. Um, I was a woman of the world, could speak four languages, re- resume, blah, blah, blah. You, you know. speak four languages? I, yes. Not as great anymore, but yes. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to get you sidetracked with the languages thing, but when you said that, I was like, because there's not that many people speak four languages. Yes. Spanish, English, French, Italian. Uh, French is Je like. Je parle un petit peu. Oh, yeah. Un, un, un petit peu. Un, un I can't even say it. Um, I was going to say Are you yeah, speaking a combination of French yeah, and Spanish? Uh, Italian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand Italian. All yeah. right, I'm going to get you sidetracked. I, mean, oh. I don't know what that was, but it works for me. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to blush now. I'm sweating. <laughs> Dana's like, oh my God, what's going on over here? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to back you up a second because the reality stuff ties into oh, the yeah. addiction stuff. So yes. I think when you, one of the things you said earlier was that when you were younger, you were modeling, you, you, you tried alcohol, you tried uh, hashish. So how old were, was that? Was that the beginning of the addiction thing, you think? Um, well, no. Uh, I tried my first drink when I was 12 years old, um, voluntarily. Like, I was like, God, I, I remember, like, in Argentina, we, like always eat together like for lunch and dinners and dinners was like a big festival every night like music like every all the neighbors came over we'd call everyone aunts and uncles even though they weren't and like I just remember like people like there's so much food filled on the tables that the drinks were on the floor and I remember people like this visual like the more they poured the longer the parties lasted <laughs> people drinking and having fun me dancing with my grandparents and my mom and dad and all this stuff and at 12 years old I was so um I, there was this moment where I just went like, I just want to feel like they did in Argentina, you know, and uh, and I took my first drink. Um, and at that moment when I took that first drink, I still remember it. Like, I remember going down into my throat, into my stomach, and it kind of imploded that, that in there. That warm feeling? Yeah, and like all of a sudden I felt like a cross between the Jolly Green Giant, Wonder Woman, and she Like, I felt like I had arrived, right? My little brother was there, and he was like, ooh, I'm telling you, and like he bribed me, took all my change, and a little jerk off went and ratted on me, and <laughs> my parents put me on restriction for the rest of my life that night, and uh, it didn't last more than 45 minutes. But I didn't know about alcoholism, addiction, in recovery or anything like that I didn't become a full like f- like blown addict or alcoholic the progression of my disease from that first drink has led me to everything and anything else and um, with the modeling you know the drinking and and all that and you know that helped you know and apparently I was like a blackout drinker um at you know at like 16 17 but I wasn't drinking every day um I smoked pot I you know I tried hashish I tried other drugs did you feel like that was a normal part of your day yeah I mean like yeah I mean because they say that you know drugs are pervasive in the modeling community so maybe uh, was it is that like just how things it it did I mean you know I I and it looked beautiful you know, it looked like fancy. Um, I remember when I was close to 18 years old, um, I was with these two girls. And at this point in my life, I was a great chameleon. Like, I feel like all addicts and alcoholics are, you know, it's it's part of our survival mechanisms. And um, I remember like, you know, we were at one of the girls' houses, they were models. And in my eyes, they were everything. And like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we're drinking out of these beautiful crystal, like champagne glasses and all that. I didn't even, I drank from like bottles and plastic cups. Like I always drink for effects, you know, I never was a connoisseur till this day I'm not of any sorts like coffee I just drink for the effects of it rock sugar free rock stars for the effect of it you know even then like I drank just for the effect and uh, all of a sudden this one girl brings out this white china plate they roll up you know pull all this white powder on there on the plate and they roll up these hundred dollar bills and they start chopping it up and they start snorting away and they were Did like you know what that was uh, I figured it out. Um, <laughs> pretty, yeah, pretty quickly when they started quick. sniffing it up their nose. Yeah, and they were like, "Do you want some?" And I was like, "Yeah, I haven't tried some in a while. Like, I had never <laughs> tried cocaine up until this moment." And I got to tell you, the moment I did that first line, I was hooked. Done. Yeah, it was over. Um, cocaine for me uh, gave me a heartbeat like nothing else ever has. In the end, you know, it brought me to my knees and it betrayed me. But um, it helped a lot in the modeling world. A lot. You know, um, the eating disorders helped a lot too. You know, I remember supermodels teaching me how to eat boxes of laxatives and um, 
and lettuce uh, when I was like 15 years old, <clears throat> excuse me, because my body started developing and I started growing and curving and all that. And, you know, they were always like, I, I mean, when I see measuring tapes now, I like kind of cringe, you know, like, because I was always being measured and like, I'm Latin, like I can't help my hips, you know, or my shoulders or, you know, and like they were like skinnier, skinnier, like all the time. And so the waif look came, was in and I was just like, oh my God, I was like hanging onto walls and barely walking. And like, I'd see that measuring tape and I'd be like, oh, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it kind of came, you know. So the drugs and the eating disorder all sort of... Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had every eating disorder. I mean, from anorexia and everything in between to obesity. I mean, I, I have... I In my sobriety uh, this last time, I ended up gaining um, over 100 pounds. I lost 140 slowly but surely. And the progression of that, that is, thank you, you shows on TV. Like, I mean, unfortunately, it's been documented. Um, but, you know, people have been like... I remember, like, people were like, oh, she's had a whole body lift. I'm like shit, I wish I had the money. You know, like I didn't do that. Like I lit, you can literally track it on, you know, all the shows and all the, you know, internet and stuff. And I've been very open about that, you know, and like today, you know, if I don't eat, um, I like start gagging, you know, like my God has a funny sense of humor. Like I either my nose drips if I'm nervous or like, you know, I start gagging. Do you get hangry? I, I get hangry. I get so hangry. And I threw, I like to say like I have moments, but I'm throwing a fucking shit fit. Like, you know, like I'm like, ah, you know, the world's coming to an end. And like nothing makes sense. Like it gets really loud. I mean, even when I do eat, it gets like that. So um, I do get hangry. So I want to know how long, how long were you dealing with the issues of addiction? Oh, uh, God, um, pretty much my whole life. I mean, you know, I, I think that you don't. I really firmly believe that, you know, it's a gene. It's actually a proven fact. It's hereditary. So this is a brain disease. It is. It is a brain disease. And I feel that a lot of times with people like, you know, there could be, and Dr. Drew talks a lot about this. So it could be like, in, like I, I'm just hypothetically speaking here, like you're an addict and I'm an addict. You have coping skills. I didn't, you know, I'm doomed to like have the addiction and be a full, full blown addict. You know, you have the ability of being able to like catch yourself and go, okay, this is not the road I want to go down, you know, um, or you have a problem problem drinking like there are problem drinkers out there they deal with the problem and then they're better um that is not my case you know I didn't have any coping tools you know at all um I've learned them thank god today so with, with reality tv was that oh. let's yeah because I know that yeah. sort of ties into the whole recovery thing so I went to uh treatment um in Los Encinas in Pasadena and one of my doctors was this name this doctor named Dr. Drew uh, and uh he could not stand me I could not stand him was that before he was Dr. Drew on he TV he was already Dr. Drew but not on celebrity rehab he was on like love line and like so you uh, did a celebrity rehab i i did but not as a patient i'll get to that point you asked too many questions before i can't even tell the story and now it's not like a big like good thing like like it's not like oh the climax were we married like, in a past life i feel like we might have been i We're don't fine. know but you need to give me climax here like you let me gotta let me tell the story that's kind of like, weird like that's kind of weird it's all right I'm, listen are you dying she's dying she's choking <laughs> on her bagel over there bad it's great <laughs> oh, you're awesome come on let's go keep it let's so, go um, <coughs> my hands are up um okay let's go bring let's, it. let's do oh, you bring it i'm ready i Let know take my earrings off we're going oh, we're going down oh, here we go it. okay okay so um so uh he uh predicted me dead dr drew he said like i was one of those hopeless cases that you just need to go through the motions with you know because i was not going to get it and some of us unfortunately need to die for the rest of us to get it is you know the term that they use in and, and all that and um you know uh I, my treatment lasted a long time like my detox alone was like three and a half weeks um the first time I went in they shut down my short-term memory they didn't know what to diagnose me I remember all the doctors like sitting over me and they're like what do you think it is what should we diagnose this and I just looked at them and I was like a fucking addict perhaps hello like you know <laughs> I'm a drug addict hello like nothing makes sense right now and um and uh I you know was in there with with, it was it was a shit show um, what had happened um, in treatment for me. I mean, that alone is a whole book. Um, I My detox lasted three and a half weeks. I, um, I lost my short-term memory. I found out later um, when I, we, it was all in one unit. Like now in treatment, like it's all these different places you go to for 
the whole facility. You know, we had it all and it was like an acre and or two acres of land. And um, from the detox, I went to the cottages and like W.C. Fields died there and um, Marilyn Monroe and, and Clark Gable used to go there in this place that I went to. And so like they have like, you know, areas named after them and stuff. And I remember taking a shower and all these numbers, again, flashing through like things flashing. And I realized I hadn't started my period and I found out I was pregnant in treatment. So they had me go through a forced miscarriage. And um, they had my main doctor had me so loaded on med. I mean, I was so high in treatment off of the medications he had me on. And, um, and now those like five days were a little longer and it's like, you know, the end of October and I finally, I'm like not feeling good. And I'm so like, I would just like drool. Like, I mean, I was just, I was terrible. I was a terrible patient. I mean, and I, I remember them saying a lot of times, like, are you going to stop acting? Like stop acting your way through this, you know? And, and, um, I went to my doctor in LA and I found out I was still pregnant with that baby that was now dead. So I had to go through a forced miscarriage. I mean, a forced, uh, a DNC, an emergency. DNC and um, it was all too real, too raw, and I. That's a lot. Up, of tr- that's a lot to deal with. It was a lot, and a lot. I wasn't able to really deal with a lot of issues, even though I was in treatment for so long at that point, you know, from July 12th to now the end of October and the first of like first week of November, I ended up relapsing in treatment. I'm one of those people that breaks a dynamic for the group, um, awakens the beast for everyone. It was just too much for me, you know, and um, I remember uh, the main nurse, you know, and I kept like saying, there is a conspiracy against me. Dr. Drew does not want me here. They're like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, I was like, thought I had game left in me. And um, the main nurse came to me and she said, you know, now they're going to come in here and they're going to blood test you and they're doing a staff meeting. This is gonna get, what's going to take, take place. And we're going to blood test you and you're going to test positive because you know that I know you're high right now and we're going to put you in the psych ward. We're going to detox you and bring you back here and uh, get you back on the road to recovery. And all I heard was psych ward. Like, I'm not going there. You know, and I bounced. I AMA'd. It was 10 weeks, one long night. Um, I was buying over an eight Where'd ball. you bounce to? Where'd Home, you go? Back to LA. Okay. Um, and uh, I was using, and uh, I was buying over an eight ball um, a day, and uh, it wasn't wasn't working. <sighs> That's a lot. Yeah, and like I was thinking of Dr. Drew's little fucking smirk he does. I was thinking of like Bob Force's red hair. He was on Celebrity Rehab. He's one of the counselors. He was my counselor in real life, and like I was thinking about like what hat he had on. I was thinking about like the groups, and like for a girl who wanted to sedate and numb herself, you know, it was like such a bad place to be because I was thinking, you know, like I could, you know, I was thinking about you guys like people and 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 in the outside world and um i ended up going in uh january 15th and um I, uh, it's a little deeper story of that, but like my mom came to me and said, you know, I'm going to pack your bags. You're going to come stay with me. You know, I don't care if you drink or use there. I just want to be with you. You know, I bared you into this world. I want to watch you take your last breath. I don't want you to die alone. Like, and at that point I was okay with it. So what's your sobriety date? January 15th. We, of what year? Oh, six. So you, how long you-, you broke my climax again. Oh, God. Yeah. This is why I'm single. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I I'm going to let you. Can I? How do I get you back to climax? I can, I'm, I can easily go there. Go ahead. Because I'm there right now. All right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's kind of weird. Like, it is. That was weird. Yeah. If any of my future, cl- yeah, I, if any of my future <laughs> clients see that, yeah, I'll probably never get it. Time out. Okay. <laughs> so um, it's Jan- you know my mom. It's January fifteenth, and my mom. Um, yeah, that was. This weird. is the craziest show I've done yet, but that's is okay. It, really? it is. It bad? No, it's great. You're is it nutty? No, I'm having a blast with you. What are you talking about? I'm like a bubble off center, and I'm okay. I love it. You're terrific. Come on. Um, I, uh, I remember, you know, I went, um, that day, January 15th, I went into treatment back to Las Encinas and they tested me. I tested positive for heroin, speed, horse tranquilizer, rat poison. I thought I was just buying Coke. Um, my, uh, main doctor told me he was going to put me in the psych ward to detox me off of, um, the opiates with narcotics. And I just looked at him and went, whatever. And that's the girl that ran from that psych ward 10 weeks prior and um that day I remember like walking into the psych ward and like the double door slamming shut and all the tickets from the locks you know and there was a line friends and family couldn't cross I could hear my mom like crying and like I saw this guy from a far away this hallway it looked eternal I'm I'm sure it's not I'd like to go back to that hallway just to visit and see the hallway not to be there um and uh he was getting tackled by two texts because he was trying to run down the corridor naked and like I mean god bless 
bless him. Um, I'm not kidding you. He ended up doing my hair for like the weeks that I was there. Um, after it was bad. Like I remember my therapist coming in and going, really? Really? And like I had him like it was just insane. Um, and then uh, I saw this one guy um, in, a, a cha- in, a, in a chair. I don't know if it was a wheelchair and his eyes were rolling back and he was drooling. I just went, what happened to me? How did I, me of all people, get here like into the psych ward? And, um, and I was like, all I wanted was that relief when I was 12 years old. Like all this is going through my head and I'm like from 12 to here, so much has happened. And um, I went to my room. My room was the last room on the left and the tech left to go get the med sheet. And I said I needed to go to the restroom and they take away shoelaces, plastic, I'm sure you're aware. And any sharp object, anything you can hurt yourself or anyone else away from you. And uh, I went into the restroom and the doors didn't connect to the, ba- uh, to the bathroom into the bedroom, our rooms. And uh, when I got up, I realized the idiots forgot the belt. And just like that, I looked up and I saw all these objects like hanging and I got on top of one of the beds. I put my belt through there and I secured it and I put my neck through there and I hung myself. Um, The last thing I remember is my feet were dangling and everything went black. Um, When I came to, I was in a five point strap and because of the fixation, um, I couldn't speak correctly. It took me three months to learn to form sentences. Miracle, I can speak. Uh, My hands and my legs shook. I had no control of them. I'd get up and say, you know, right foot move and I'd fall I was in a wheelchair from the wheelchair I went to a walker to a a cane I learned to freely walk like four or five months later Um, I had no control of my bodily functions I was in depends I like to call them diapers Um, I uh, threw up profusely on myself because of the detoxing Um, and I was just it was the worst place ever like and the craziest thing was my brain worked perfectly and I I couldn't connect you know to the world and I remember one day um, I was by the window and I was holding on to the like double like they had bars and like it was a double it was a frosty window and I could hear people because it was an open meeting and stuff and like people there's different areas of the facility and I opened it like a quarter of an inch and I could smell the smoke of people smoking cigarettes and I heard all this chatter and I felt all these feelings that I really didn't understand I could hear someone yelling at someone from far away And um, I literally said in my head, God, is it humanly possible for a girl like me to ever feel what they're feeling? And if so, I'll go to any lengths to feel that. And for me, that's my day of surrender. However, my clean date is January 15th. And I kid you not, as I tell the story, every time I tell that part of the story, like that girl that said that that day resides so alive inside of me. And like, it has been a journey. So I ended up staying from January 15th till April 30th. You know, in total, it was like almost eight months, like from July to like April 30th or something like that, seven and a half months. And I was like, you guys, I need to go get my life back in L.A. And I went back to L.A. and I did the aftercare plan that they make you do in treatment. And I didn't follow that through. And all I did was contemplate suicide and using every single day. I did not know how to do this thing called life. Um, At nine months sober, I ended up moving back. um, I moved into a sober living. I had made millions in my life, you know, and um, I lost every single penny. I only had enough for a month and a half um and I was like to my sponsor like now what you know you know and she was like you know I can't enable you into a grave but if you want to do the program I'll go you know to any lengths to try to help you I ended up going to meetings in like Crenshaw 96 where she got sober it was like OG style you know like these people like they were like they did not like give a fuck like what it was about it was about saving my life and that was all it was about not saving my face not they didn't want to hear anything about my resumes or anything I thought like they didn't care they wanted it like this is about life or death and that's how I grew up you know in my recovery and um I moved out of LA. Um, I lived, I thought it was in Egypt. It was an hour outside only. Um, And um, I, at two and a half years sober, you know, I'd called Hollywood a chapter, you know, and, and my sponsor at that, those nine months told me, you know, I don't, I need you to believe in something bigger than you. I don't give a shit what it is as long as it's not you. And she's like, do you think that's humanly possible? And I was like, I guess. And, you know, she's like, you'll never lack. And I never lacked, you know, not one day my sobriety may have not gotten what I wanted, but I never lacked. And, um, I, uh, moved, you know, outside and they told me it was time to get a job. And I was like, I don't know who I want to be. And my sponsor's like, great, go write down who you want to be, what you want to do and go apply it two places I'm like why why and she's like I'm like where you know like I literally was did not know and she was like and I remember her saying this so vividly she's like I don't give a shit like uh 
uh, Starbucks and Target. That's where you're going to go. And I was like, what the fuck am I going to give him a headshot? Starbucks and, and yeah, Target? exactly. And I was like, what the fuck am I going to give him a headshot and a resume? Like, I have no job skills. I had no job skills. And she was like, Faith Without Works is dead. And write down who you want to be and what you want to do. And I, she was like, oh, and dream big. And I was like, really? Like, I could feel the humility. She was like, dream big. And so I went and I applied. I didn't get those two jobs. But Dr. Drew, who predicted me dead, came to me six weeks later and said, you know, I'm doing this spinoff show called Sober House on VH1. Um, it's a spinoff from Sober Rehab. I'd like you to run the show, uh, the the house. And I had never worked in treatment. What had happened was I took over all the meetings and, and at the place I got sober at, or like a few of them, and like I took commitments and like I made, I brought all in my big huge celebrity friends and huge circuit speaker people to come in like speak at these meetings and like the meetings changed from like 18 people to like 195 people and like it was like it was it, Dr. Drew started giving me his patients, his female patients for fun and for free, you know, to sponsor, and uh, he was like, it's people like you that keep me doing what I'm doing. I want to, you know, thank you for that and I just looked at him amazing yeah and I just looked at him and I was like ain't that about a bitch and I just smiled you know and that gave me my second you know chance in life and um, I had no idea doing that show would change my life so much and that I would find my passion but I already had a passion with working with people but not the way I do now, you know, like, I mean, I, that was part of the program. And, um, you know, I did two seasons of that and a few seasons of suburb rehab. I started working in treatment and, um, I, um, started doing these other reality shows like model Latina. I started doing CNN. They call, I started talking about, I started losing the weight. Um, and I would talk about my eating disorder. I mean, I talk about everything publicly, you know, and, and, and I started fighting for people like me, you know, because I believe in second chances. How about you become an inspiration? You have. In spite of my character defects, they become my biggest We all have our own demons. Yeah, yeah, we do. But look at you. You That's amazing. Thank you. I don't know you that well, but I'm really proud of you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And then my girlfriend was on Housewives uh, Beverly Hills, and I did four seasons of that. It was a huge platform. One of the things, uh, the things I wrote down, there was like 85 things I wrote down that day, by the way, um, of who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And it was things like, I want to make a difference. I want to back on TV. I want to be a producer. I want to be a businesswoman. I want to be an advocate. I want to, you know, have a huge platform I want to be in movies I want to you know to be a provider for my family all these things right so the housewives was a huge platform you know for me to keep carrying the message and like I always think like is this going to help like you know inspire someone is this like my alternative motive always is like is this you know going to help me be able to carry the message and I always pray for a higher platform you know or a platform any platform so I can keep passing this on but you know the acting you know they told me I was a reality just a reality girl I did so many reality shows and um I um I've done like four movies back now and they're they've been independents they've won awards like it's been great you know um and then I go through struggles and I go through ups and I go through downs and life is just a journey you know and it is it is. It really is. It really is. I feel like this year has been a lot of endings and a lot of new beginnings, and I'm very um, optimistic. Today, yesterday was in my head. I was a little paralyzed. I, we were on the phone. I think I told you I was like stuck in my well, head. It was interesting because when I tried to, when you know, we played a little phone tag when you were in LA, and I knew there was. I mean, they had the shooting, then they had the fires. Had I the, mean, it the was election shooting, and yeah, uh, it was insa- it's insanity. And it's interesting because you know, you left me a voicemail. And I, I think t- I just rambled on until it I, cut me off. I said, wow, she sounds busy. Yeah. And, but yet, you know, then we connected yesterday on the phone. I was like, wow. She, it was just like, it was a certain calmness about you. It really was. That's so funny. I was so paralyzed yesterday in my own No, head. You, you were great. I was so, it was so, I, I was frankly shocked. I actually said, oh my God. I said, and I even said to you, I said, is this, is this really Jennifer? Yeah. Is yeah. recording? So I was so glad to get you on the phone and you were so, well, you can ask, you can ask, you can ask Heidi what I texted to her after we spoke. I'm not going to. Uh, okay. I, I did. I texted her. Oh, office. really? I did. I, you must have touched something in me. I don't know what it was, but I was obviously moved. I just. Yesterday? I did. I, I thought I, I was a nut job yesterday. You were a nut job. I like being nut. I'm nutty. Like, that's who I am. You're like, I'm kind so of all well. over the place. And I, you know, I do say, like, I don't have it all together. And it's kind of a good thing. We're you know? in progress. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I know the more time I have, um, the less I know. And they're all like, they're just a lot of yesterdays put together for me in recovery. You know, it's just, but it's just learning how to live through today. Like, this is a new experience for me. Have we gone on, like, way too long? Well, we go, it's okay. We're almost done. 
but I don't. Because you keep I, looking down now. Well, it's I like do. Making, I ke- it's I kind keep, of like that thing. Like you better go now. Like, no, you know what? I keep track. Of, I keep track of time because I don't want to go too long. Because then they're gonna not be interested. Well, no, well, no. But then I know you have other stuff to do, and I know you know I don't want to. We should eat. do a five-hour podcast right now. You want to do a five? No, just kidding. <laughs> Deanna and Jay's like, dude, we're not doing a five po- five-hour podcast. <laughs> He's like changing tape. <laughs> Did I just go so off center? No, all the questions you, you were didn't. On? No, you were great. Okay. You, you honestly, I have had some. We've had some good guests, but you are the most fun. Really? You are the. I was so excited to have you on the show. Really? Really? Yeah. Well, I read about you. I sort of knew that you'd be, that you had a, you'd had a, f- a fascinating history and. There's so many, I didn't touch on anything. Well, we might have to get. We're going to bring you back then because we might have to. Yeah. Because I bet we could. You and I could sit here and talk for five, four or five hours. Yeah. But then I mean, I'd have to order food in. I'd have to cancel the rest of my day. I mean, we're going to have to continue this. Okay. But I want to know what you, before we wrap up, I want to know what you're doing now. Right now, um, I've been speaking all over the country. Um, I, um, I'm i in the midst of doing these shows. I can't talk about it yet, but I can't wait to come back on and tell you you're about coming, it. I'm having you on. Um, I cannot wait. Um, I, um, in doing, I'm doing a woman's retreat with um, Heidi and uh, Amanda. Uh, I just said Amanda, I bit my tongue. Amanda, I'm so excited about it. I've never done that before. Where it's not gonna be necessarily, I, I don't- When's that happening? Uh, I think it's happening in January or maybe early February, but I'm hoping it's January. These women, these two women, they're like badass lady bosses. And I just get so turned on when I see women that are in power and like have strength and are like fearless and yet vulnerable. And they are everything. Like, I love it. And we just want to empower women. Um, I also, I mean, I have so many things. Like, Heidi is really pushing for me to be a life coach um, as well. And you should do it. I know. And I, um, she was like, I'm creating your email account. And so I, I just kind of want to, like, I, I'm throwing that out there. It's the first time I'm actually saying that. Um, I'm going to start doing that. Right. Um, I'm, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I love working with men and women. I love, like, I can see things. Like, Drew always said that, like, you see things. Like, I have the gift of intuition. I'm really good for you. I'm not good for me. Like, I can see the, the intuition and, yeah, like, I can see things for you. Um, I, you know, this has been a, a journey, you know, like, and, and I am so blessed. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I put acting on hold for a little while. Like, I was in this uh, weird space um, for, like, I kind of lost my voice, even though I was, speaking everywhere, I lost myself, you know, in a relationship, in my career. Like I felt like I was staying stagnant um, in a lot of areas and I just let go. And I just remember this year, I just went, God, I'm jumping, the net better catch me. And it never fails, it always catches me. I, I feel like I can do many things, you know. I, I'm, I, I, I'm. I believe it. Very determined. Um, I believe that you could do anything you wanted to. I, I really. Ultimately. I, I see that because you have your. I mean, the force is strong with you. You know what I mean. You have. I mean, really. I mean, Doctor Drew's like, you're going to be dead. And you're like, fuck you. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I'm going to be. In fact, I'm going to go on a reality show and then I'm going to save a shitload <laughs> of people. So fuck you. And it's going to be yours. Yes. How about that? <laughs> I know. I you know. I'm eternally grateful for Doctor Drew. I mean, like he 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 loves us addicts and alcoholics. He's not one of us, but he loves crazy around home. I mean, like he had me and Bob Forrest and Shelly and like, you know, those people are like, Bob was my counselor. I did, I ended up, by the way, doing aftercare for five years. It changed my life. And it was with Bob Forrest. And I learned so much, like, just like, it's about having empathy and human connection, you know, really. I think this whole thing called life is really about that. I love it. We, we got to talk more. All right, we're going to wrap up. And then, and then when we're done, you're not going to talk about how I'm going to get you back on here. Even if I have to put you on Zoom, I'm having you back on the I'll show. I'll do it. I'm here. We're doing it. All right. So thank you, Jay and, and Deanna, for being so patient with us. I'm so sorry it went so long. No. you kidding me? I love having you. We're not done. I'm not done with you. No, yay. Because you know what? I'm going to have you back on because I want you to talk more about what you're doing and how we can help more people. Okay. Because your story is inspirational, but then we need to talk about what we're going to do to... Let's ha- do this. To help more people. Okay. All right. So look, the show uh, is going to air. Uh, we're going to be airing on Friday at five o'clock on Facebook Live. Uh, Facebook. So uh, you can go to the Mark G. Astor uh, Facebook show, uh, Facebook page. Oh, you see, you got me your tongue tied. I'm a little fucking. Like, <laughs> you rattled me here a little. Uh, the drug and alcohol attorneys. <laughs> Deanna, Deanna's like, oh my God, what's going on here? I saw a lot of that. Yeah. The drug and alcohol attorneys Facebook show. We're on YouTube. You can go to drugandalcoholattorneys.com. 
uh, our website. Uh, you can email me at mark at drug and alcohol attorneys.com. Our phone number is 561-419-6095. This is going to be the best show yet. And uh, look at you. Balls to the wall. That's you know how we what? Take it. You're going to make it. You're going to help a lot of people. I know that. Thank you. You really are. I hope so. You are. I, there's no hoping about it. It's, at the end of the day, when all is said and done, if I can help one, if I, if I, I think I, you're going to help a lot more than one. If but if one you, help, God helped or, or felt something, some kind of emotion, or felt a connection, then I'm good. I believe it. You are good. All right, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show, Jen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh.